So I'm Pastor Yasmin. If you don't know me, I would love to get to know with you. Hi, Paul. I haven't been here for a couple of weeks. How are you doing? Good. That's good. Paul's always like there to give me encouragement because he's always amening and hallelujah <laughs> and saying hallelujah from the front. So it's kind of nice. Um, so yes, if you don't know me or maybe I've never actually had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you, I would love to meet you in the lobby after service and talk. Um, if not, um, I'm one of the pastors at the neighborhood church. Um, if you know me, I apologize that you're getting me two weekends in a row. So you're just going to have to make do as Pastor John and Pastor Jordan are both away. Um, and then our district superintendent is going to speak uh, next weekend. So that's exciting. Um, and we're looking forward to that. So we're continuing in the message, small book, big ideas. We're in first John chapter three. Um, if you haven't been with us, I'm going to give you a really quick recap of some of the context of what first John is. Because sometimes it's really difficult to just dive into a book of the Bible and really fully understand what's happening. Maybe in your life, you've come across some really old letters, maybe from a parent or a grandparent, a great grandparent, maybe even a spouse. And you start reading these letters or these notes that they've left behind and you have no clue what's going on, right? Who are they speaking to? I'm like super confused. I don't even know what this means. Um, maybe it was really long ago, so you don't even understand some of the lingo and the language. Well, I think sometimes that's kind of how the Bible can be for all of us. We can kind of be so confused when we just dive into a book and expect to just know exactly what's happening. So my quick little summary of what's going on, because I'm trying to keep it different each week and not give you the exact same information. So John is writing this letter and he is one of Jesus's disciples. He got to live with Jesus, an eyewitness of his time here on earth. And at this time of John's writing, there are these people who are going around distorting the gospel and they were called Gnostics. These people thought that they were super spiritual and that they had some kind of secret spiritual knowledge that only came to them. And they thought that they had a special anointing. And if you would follow them and listen to them, they would tell you all about the real spiritual Jesus. And so John wants us to know that it's not a secret in history because it's flesh and blood Jesus Christ. He saw things. He heard things in the flesh. It's not a secret in history. John says for him, it was a lived experience. John said he saw Jesus with his own eyes. I touched him with my hands. This guy is the rock solid real deal. You don't have to become some secret spiritual crazy person to know Jesus. Jesus is there and accessible for all of us. John wants us to know that. Know that who we are in Jesus and what it looks like to be a child of God. Being a child of God, living like you're a child of God, when you truly believe that you are a child of God, when you remember that and you live like that, it completely changes the very essence of who you are. So today, that's what we're going to look at. Three characteristics of what a child of God looks like, according to John. Characteristics that make us look different. So we are going to read 1 John chapter 3. If you have your Bibles or your phones with us, it will come up on the screen. Verses 1 to 10. Now last week, we did go through verses 1 to 3. But it really needs to be a part of this message today as well, just to fully understand what's happening. Plus, it'll give me a chance to recap a few things if you've missed out, and also a chance to add some things that I didn't get the chance to add. So here we go. I'm going to read it in its complete entirety before we start to address it. See or behold, some versions say, what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure." Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. 
No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God, and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So this portion is a little heavier. So there's this movie called Princess Diaries. And I'm pretty sure most of you have heard of it and quite possibly seen it. It's a Disney movie. I'm talking about the original one that came out. It's a pretty classic movie now. Um, it would have been come out about 20 years ago. Um, and you might have, if you've had kids in the last 20 years, you've probably seen it on the Disney Channel or went to it or whatever. I was actually quite shocked to find out that it came out in 2001. Um, I was telling my friend this week that it made me feel a lot older because it feels like a new movie. Um, but then I realized, you know what? But Paige was absolutely obsessed with it when she was little, and both her and Bailey still watch it today. So this movie is this cute, funny, sweet movie. There's this kind of goofy girl named Mia, and she's in high school. She's kind of nerdy, but lives a pretty normal life with her mom. Now, one day her grandma shows up from this fictional place called Genovia and says, hey, you know what? I'm the queen. And my son, your father, who has died, was a prince. So you're next to sit on the throne, and you alone are going to rule someday. Mia finds out that she's a princess. And it changes who she is because of who her dad is. It changes who she is. So I look at this passage today, and it says that you and I are called the children of God. If you love Jesus and have accepted him as your Lord and Savior, the Bible calls you a child of God. Now, for Mia, it changed her life that her earthly father was a prince. So for us, I wonder how it changes our lives if we consider that our heavenly father is the king of the world. To be the ruler of the universe, the king of all kings. This is God, and it changes who we are. And just like Mia's grandma said, you know what? I'm going to teach you how to walk and to talk and to study and teach you how to be a princess. John is saying here there are certain indicators, certain characteristics of who a child of God is. And I want to teach them to you. So we're going to look at these three characteristics of a child of God. The first one being their life looks different from the world. The second one. Their hope is in God alone. And the third, they practice righteousness. And you will see that these all actually kind of flow into one another. That's why I'm giving them to you right off the top, because they will come up and they will cross over. But first, I'm going to recap a way of preparing your heart for this message about God's love. A little bit of what I shared last week in slightly different words. We learned about how much God loves you, that he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of, from all of our unrighteousness, and that his love is so big, so enormous, that it basically squishes you and compels you to become a lover of all people. And so John, as he's continuing to tell us the good news, that's why it begins with this behold or see, do you see what kind of love is this? You really got to get all that, get all the other stuff that came before it to understand all of John's emotions behind this. This behold, this see, check it out, this kind of love that God has given us. We were forgiven, forgiven of all. We are loved, we are victorious, so much so that John says that we can only be described as God's own kids. Wow. Behold, what kind of love is this? Like I talked about last week, it literally means what country does this thing even come from? In what world does God love people that much? 
See, back then, this audience, they were so used to pagan gods. Maybe you've got the idea that God doesn't love you that much either. And why do I bring up love again? Because I think so many people find it difficult to believe that anyone can actually love them. And that might sound crazy to you, but it's not to me. I talk to people all the time who feel alone, that have done things. They feel like nobody wants them, even when they're at their very best. And no one could possibly ever love them at their worst. How many of you go around flaunting your worst to everybody, knowing that they're going to absolutely love you? Not many. That tells us something right there. We have a world of shattered hearts. So how in the world could I believe that God loves me this much? How could I possibly believe it? How could I believe that he lavishly loves me? Let's go even further. What if I told you that he can't get enough of you? Like sands on a seashore, says David in Psalms 139. That's his thoughts about you. He can't get enough of you. What if I told you that he would rather die than lose you? What if I told you he fights for you? What if I told you he went to hell for you? What if I told you that he would rather be tortured, spit on, humiliated, and shamed than to ever shame you by holding even one of your sins against you? Can you imagine it? That he would love me that much? That my whole life would actually be described as nothing short of an absolute certain victory. Where I know, I know that my current reality is that I am his dearly, absolutely, unashamedly, delighted in, held close, lavishly loved, can't get further into his heart, child. Would you then say, what country is that love from? In what kind of universe could that even be true? And John says, this one. This one. Because this is our God. And twice John says we are children of God. We are. And I love it. We are children of God now, here on this earth. You know why I think that he repeats it? Because we don't believe it. We don't pay attention to it. You don't know it. You don't understand it. But you need to get it deep, deep down in your gut. God is love. And one day you are going to see it. One day you will see love face to face. I promise you. And it's your greatest need. To see God as he is. You will experience love as it is. And all of your hiding, all of your covering, all of your shame, all of your blame will be done forever. I can't wait for that day. (laughs) And when we get that and try to reflect that, like we really get that love, and we go into this world as children of God and try to reflect that into the world, we will look different. We will. I went to a play this week, Martin, um, it was a fictional play of Martin Luther King Jr. Lots of real facts in there. But then all week I was seeing quotes from Martin Luther King Jr. I don't know if it's like the Facebook tracking world or what. But anyways, it said, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. Love. It's that powerful. That different. And God's love is transforming. So that's why my first point, my first characteristic is that we will look different. Then my second point, which again, these will all blend into each other, but 
just the hope, says John in verse three, thus the hope in him purifies himself. So my third or my second characteristic of God is they will hope in God alone. Just hope, just believe in that and the hope itself will actually begin to change your life. It begins to wash out impurities because the impurity comes from knowing that you're not loved. It just washes over you. You need this love, build your life on this love. Just that changes things. We know who we are now. We are children of God. As children of God, we're going to act differently. We're going to look different from the world because our hope, like we were singing in the song, is in God alone. If you are a child of God, your hope is in Jesus and Jesus alone. And let me tell you, it won't always look perfect. We won't do it right all of the time. Sometimes our hope gets distracted by different things. We put our hope in money and jobs and people and success, but none of that works. But the more you live your life, here's the goal, to put more and more hope in Jesus Christ. And when you put more and more hope in Jesus every single day, it makes her harder and harder to sin. Let me say it like this, kind of an example. When you're hoping in Jesus, it's really hard to say lie. Okay? Because your hope is not no longer in the way that people perceive you to be. Your hope is no longer in some sort of financial gain. So you have no incentive to lie. Because, hey, my hope is in Jesus. That deal didn't go through. Okay, that sucked. But my hope is in Jesus. That person isn't going to think, well, that person's going to think poorly of me because of something I said or something I did or something I didn't wear. Um, it's okay. My hope is in Jesus. So John is saying when you put your hope in Jesus, you become closer and closer like him and more and more sinless. Verse three, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure, looking more and more like Jesus every day. And Jesus says this in John 14, six, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. Jesus is the bridge to God for us. Our hope is in Jesus and Jesus alone. Our third characteristic, you will practice righteousness. So this is the part of the message that's going to be a lot harder to hear today. Verses four to five. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Lawlessness is a rebellion against God. That can be the way you view God or maybe a specific act that demonstrates this refusal to acknowledge God. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins and in him there is no sin. So that's why Jesus came to take away our sins. That's why we celebrate him at Christmas and Easter is because he came to earth to take away our sins, dying for us. And then you look at verse six, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. <sighs> well, that's a, a gut check for me anyways. Maybe it's not a gut check, or maybe you're thinking like, do I keep on sinning? Do I make a practice of sinning in my life? I think we all have to examine our own lives and say, what is the practice in my life? Do I practice lawlessness? Do I practice sinning or do I practice righteousness? What do I do? Because look at what he says in verse seven, little children, he's being all nice and pastoral, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. John is saying your actions matter. What you do matters. What you say matters matters. What you do identifies whose you are and who you belong to. 
And that's kind of hard to hear for some of us. And I think if we're being honest, all of us, because none of us are perfect. But John isn't talking about, okay, you messed up and you repented and that's good. And that draws you closer to God as we do that. John's talking about the practice. What is the practice in your life? What is the identifying characteristics of your life? Sin or righteousness? That's what John's asking you here because he's saying, hey, you know, if you really are a child of God, if you claim to be this, you can't keep on sinning and still claiming to be in a relationship with him. It doesn't work like that because what you do matters. It identifies who you belong to. That matters in your life. So let's look at the end of what verse eight says. The reason the son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. You want to destroy the works in your life, the sin, the problem that has a grip on you? Trust in Jesus. Put your hope in him and it can be gone. I have a question for you. If I was to hire um, an outside firm or a private investigator for your life, what would he see? What are those defining characteristics in your life that he would see? Would it be defining characteristics of sin or would it be righteousness? What if I asked your next door neighbor or the person that you see every day on your commute that drives way too slow or the person that drives you absolutely crazy or the person that's different than you? What if I asked them? Or how about your coworkers and your family members, the people who know you best? What if I asked them, what are the defining characteristics of your life? What do you make a practice of? A practice of sitting or a practice of righteousness? What would they say? I know that that question sounds hard and I don't want to ask it in a mean way. I don't actually want to ask it in a condemning way either. I love you and I want to push you to live a life that God created you to live. I want to push you towards Jesus more and more every single day. So I ask you that so that when you leave here or even right now in this moment, you really think and you really ask yourself, what are the defining characteristics of my life? what? Who am I like? What do I do? What do I think about? What do I say? And then verse nine, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. The word seed in its original language in Greek, don't want to gross anybody out, but you're going to know this word without me having to explain it. You're going to know what it means. In Greek, the word seed is sperma. Literally, God's sperma abides in you. Why can you not keep on sinning? Because you're a child of God. God says, you are my child, whether you like it or not. That's who I've created you to be. And that's the person that he wants you to be. It's a person God strives for you to be. It's a child of God. God abides within us. And then look at what John says here. You can't keep on sinning. So verse 10, by this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Again, harsh. I know to hear this. I get that. But ask yourself, what are the defining characteristics in your life? Is it, as a child of God, are you practicing righteousness? Because children of God practice righteousness. They don't practice sinfulness in their life. And I say that word practice repeatedly on purpose because it's the language that John is using here. What are those things that define your life? We're all going to mess up. 
We're, we're not going to live sinlessly. John talks about that earlier on in this book. None of us can live sinlessly. It's not going to happen. We're, we're not Jesus. He is, so we can't. Jesus can. But we can make a practice of living sinlessly. We're always going to mess up. But can you make this a practice? What's the practices that make up your life? What defining characteristics are you? Make you. What would those people say that I mentioned before? The investigators or your family? Do they match up with a child of God or do they line up with what John would say here, the child of the devil? Again, harsh. But in love, I want you to live in relationship with Jesus. I want you to live a life that God created you to live. And at the neighborhood church, we think that's so important. Jesus says this in John 10.10. 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And not just life eternally, but life here on earth. So we want you to live this life so that you, and you know, like we want you to live it abundantly and, and be a child of God and show these characteristics. But you're probably saying, well, how in the world am I supposed to do that? How do I live like a child of God? How do they live? What is it supposed to look like? How do I go out of this place today, out of this church or from online and act like a child of God? How do I do that? Well, I don't have all the answers, but here's what I want you to remember first and foremost, because I think it's the thing that we forget the most every single day. On the forefront of your mind every day, remember that you are a child of God. Start there. You are a child of God. If you love Jesus, you are different. And just like Mia's grandma said in the movie when she came to see her, hey, you're different now. Your dad is royalty. I'm telling you today, if you love Jesus Christ with all your heart, your heavenly father is royal. In fact, he's the most royal person of all. He's the creator of the universe and he loves you so much. And so remember this, you are a child of God and your life doesn't have to look like the rest of the world. You don't have to get caught up in everything that this world has to offer you. You can say no. You can choose righteousness over sinless, sin, sinfulness. You can say I'm a child of God and I'm going to act different because my life looks different because I follow Jesus Christ. That's what my life looks like. And that's what's so amazing about the message of Jesus is that Jesus came to take away our sins to help us find a way back to him, to make us look like him. And that is amazing. And I want to add this, and I know I've said this before, but not all of us have perfect earthly fathers, right? And let's be honest, none of our fathers are perfect. And so sometimes we can kind of have this preconceived notion of what it means to have a relationship with a father. But see, our heavenly father is perfect. He's amazing. He doesn't walk out on you and he loves you. In fact, he sent his one and only son to die for you on the cross. And here's the thing. Could you imagine how much that would have hurt? Imagine how much that would hurt a father or a parent, a mother, seeing their kids in pain. That's one of the hardest things for me is seeing my kids in pain, whether it's physically or emotionally. I would get upset when my child had a needle or a shot. It would pain me when they were little because they were crying. And now I couldn't even imagine the amount of sadness that God would have had when he saw his one and only son dying on the cross, dying a horrific, painful death so that we could be called sons and daughters of God, so that we could be his children. 
Remember that God's seed abides within you. You are a child of God. If you love Jesus this morning, maybe you don't. Maybe you've never really accepted this truth, accepted Jesus. Well, if that's you, we would love to talk to you, pray with you after the service, answer your questions, because you know what? You could change that decision today. And then you're a child of God. The worship team can come up. Now, when you leave here this week and you head into the week, and even now as we're going into worship and we respond to this message, I want you to really think about some of these characteristics. What are the defining characteristics in your life? What are the choices that you're making? Are you a child of God by the things that you do? The things that you do, like the action. Because John says this stuff in your life, the things that you do, that it matters. That it really, really matters. So we're going to sing this song called No Longer Slaves. And in it, it talks about no longer being a slave to the things on earth. And, and one of those things, it's not just about money and, you know, power and all those things. One of those big things is fear. And it talks about in this song that you are a child of God. And because of it, it changes who you are. It changes how you act, the choices that you make, the things that you do. So really, really examine your heart with those things so that we can go into our lives and, and make it a practice of righteousness, not sin. And this lets others around you know who you belong to, who your father is. You are a child of God. Please stand. We're going to pray and we're going to go into a time of worship. Father God, I, I thank you for your word. I thank you for those who have come before us, like John, one of your disciples, who shares your truths with us, Father. God, I thank you so much for sending your son and for calling us your children, for loving us so much that you die on a cross for us, Father. I pray that as your children, that we wouldn't keep on living our lives like the rest of the world, that we wouldn't keep living our lives however we want, Father, that we would look more and more like you every day. God, I pray that we would release that control over our lives and let you lead us and guide us. Father, can you help us with that? Will you help us to remember that we are your children? We are yours. And because of that, it looks different. Help us to do that this week. Help us to examine our hearts, even right now as we go into a time of worship. What characteristics are defining our lives? Help us represent you well, Father. Represent our Father well. The King of Kings. And Father, just shine through us as your children on this earth, Father. Let us represent the kingdom in such a glorious way, Father, just to glorify your name. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.